hello everyone. I think we should uh, start because as, as uh, according to the great academic tradition, we are very much uh, on time. Uh, so it's, it's great to have you. Welcome to, um, to our panel on migration and the integration of minorities uh, in Europe. And please let me introduce our uh, fine panel. Um, to my left is, uh, is Chloe. Uh, it's the PhD student at uh, Stockholm School of Economics uh, at the Department of Economics specializing in political economy. Um, then we have, um, of course, Claudio, who's a lecturer in European politics at the Faculty of Political Science. And now, uh, bear with me, uh, let's go. I need, to, I need my notes. At National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Bucharest, uh, Romania, absolutely fantastic name. It's great to have you. Uh, and least, uh, last but not least, uh, it's Lawrence, uh, professor at as well Stockholm School of, uh, of of Economics, director of the Center for Responsible Leadership and academic lead on Civica at that university, specializing in uh, inclusive societies. Uh, and I'm Arthur, your moderator for Mosul School of Economics, and I do behavioral law and economics. It's great to have you. Um, I already introduced you to our topic, but this is not the only thing that Civica does. Um, so let me introduce you to this bad boy. Uh, the rest of the Civica projects that are currently running. And maybe I'll read a couple of those to you. So we have the project on contesting the court, examination think judicial politics in the EU without an acronym. I think that's a pity. Um, I couldn't find one. Uh, if there is no acronym, I think, guys, you, you should do better. Um, even if you are very serious lawyers, acronyms are just fine, right? Uh, you can always torment your uh, dyslectic moderator, for example. Um, we have a counterterrorism and safeguarding um, in response to Islamic State. Cassius by his acronym, local mobilization against the EU, territorial dimensions of populist uh, euroscepticism, that's ULOC, and we have uh, a representative of the project uh, on our panel. We have a, a doozy, migrants integration into EU countries for a selected few only, current shifts in conceptions of integration and impact on societal and ethnic inequalities in host countries, that's Marita. We also have <laughs> Lawrence representing the project, fantastic name, we already know what it's all all about uh, people and international politics in post-war Europe, PB, I think that's a great acronym, uh, religion, <laughs> liberal consti uh, illiberal constitutionalism, and the retrogression of fundamental rights in East Central Europe, I think that's my region, uh, that's Relicon, and towards a common framework for evaluating EU policies' effectiveness in achieving its green transformation goals, e e um, evaluate EU? I appreciate that. That's, that's a really good one. Uh, I bet they have uh, a lot to, to write about <laughs> how this is going. Um, okay, um, and that's what Civica does. Uh, and maybe let's move now to our wonderful um, projects on the panel. Um, so a couple of words because before the, the first one. Um, of course, uh, as you might know, uh, there is an ongoing on uh, the conference is a, well, great break for me for a bloody political campaign before the Sunday election um, in Poland. Um, and one of the main themes, uh, especially what's interest in interesting to me in the light of the current um, visa scandal in Polish Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, is the prevailing insistence on security and fear uh, in the political sphere and the election process from mainly the ruling party. Um, not only, and pointing constantly towards migration, towards crisis. Whoa, whoa, be careful. We have a malfunction. Please, go ahead. Well, and we're back. <laughs> well, nothing like 
starting with a bang. Um, I would be very, very interested to dig deeper into frameworks on how this actually plays out um, on your fantastic project, because all I see is non-existent threat from minorities in Poland, ethnic, political, any, actually, uh, including the little over three million Ukrainians now present <laughs> in Poland who are doing just fine. Um, so I was, I was wondering whether you could shed some light on why do politicians do it and how do policing plays a role in that. So please, Zoe, the floor is yours. Yeah, so um, thank you for the... Ah, oh, okay, so I'm, I'm supposed to present, right? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, today I'm going to present for the first time uh, uh, my project Local Democracy and State Power, Immigrants, Inclusion and Marginalization that is jointly worked with other economists, um, Roberto Galbiati, who is here at Sciences Po, and uh, Mitch Domni, who is also at the Stockholm School of Economics. So let me start, since this panel is about Europe, uh, let me start with um, a little bit of overview of spatial segregation of uh, immigrants in Europe. So here uh, is a graph about um, the share of respondents so immigrant respondents who say that they live in a neighborhood where most other people in their area are also immigrant from the same uh, backgrounds as themselves, okay? So if we had um, la perfect integration, these shares sh should be zero because those are minorities. Um, but as you see, we are far from zero. Uh, and, uh, and in Belgium, in the Netherlands, Netherlands, the share of people who say that they live in neighborhoods with a majority uh, of other immigrants is, uh, goes up to 60%. Um, in France, which is the country of interest uh, for my project, this is also quite high with almost 40%. Okay, so... Um, so this uh, lack of this lack of integration and segregation causes, has uh, numerous consequences, and one of them is distrust in institutions, in particular distrust um, uh, toward uh, the police, okay? And unfortunately, uh, like we applied for this project a year ago, but the recent news uh, gives me an example of, uh, of like what happened uh, in some uh, high segregated uh, neighborhood. Um, here I show you a picture uh, of the riots that follow the death of uh, Nahel, who is a um, uh, a teenager from immigrant origin who, um, who, who was fatally shot uh, by, by police um, in June. Uh, and, and that uh, created uh, a lot of, uh, that yeah, followed uh, a lot of riots in, um, in many French cities, okay? So this goes, that doesn't work. You click or something. Okay, so this goes back to the question uh, of, of, um, of policing. So what do police do and what should police do? So just to tell you a little bit, we're not the first one who thought about that, obviously. So uh, the literature shows that indeed um, police uh, reduce crimes, okay? Um, but uh, it has all the consequences. And for example, aggressive policing might traumatize minority youth and undermines their education and success. Um, on the opposite, we have responsive and community-orienting policing that could um, um, increase trust in institutions uh, and, and especially the police and the government, okay? There are other questions that one might ask um, is that should a police be national, 
should we have the same policing uh, nationwide or can we adjust, how can we adjust to local context? Also, does it depend to whom the, the police uh, officer are accountable? And we have decided uh, to use the French context because um, it has uh, two levels of police, so a national level, but also every municipality can choose to open a municipal police department. Okay, so we are trying to, to see how this affects uh, immigrant communities and youth uh, in particular. Do they benefit from it, as the, the community policing literature would suggest? Are they, are they harm, as the aggressive policing literature would suggest? Does it depend, does it matter who has the power, if the, the minority uh, uh, have the political power, or does it matter if it's uh, anti-immigrant um, parties that uh, have the, 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 the power? And lastly, um, in what ways uh, are the young people affected? Is it by the schooling, employment, or housing, okay? Okay, so we are using uh, the municipal police, which is nice because it has high variations in the tasks that police officers can do. Um, they have a set of tasks that relate to prevention and another set of tasks that relate to uh, repression, okay? So the head of the municipal police uh, department is the mayor, and that's the one who decides which tasks are gonna be allocated to the, to the police officers. So mayors from different parties might affect totally different tasks, and some of these tasks might be more efficient to reduce crime, but uh, so, uh, like aggressive tasks might also um, trigger an adverse effect, especially on uh, young uh, men uh, from immigrant origin, which are often the one targeted by uh, the aggressive policing. Okay, so um, just to give you a little overview of what uh, happened in the last two decades, there were a recent expansion of municipal department, a geographical expansion, meaning that more and more uh, municipalities decided to open uh, municipal pol police departments. It's mostly an urban phenomenon, but uh, immigration as well, uh, so, so that's uh, not a problem. Um, and uh, the number of police officers also dramatically increased with 77% more um, in the, since 2002. Besides the geographical expansion, we also have an expansion in tasks, uh, and they tend to substitute from the national police, and more and more of them have uh, firearms, for example. Um, then I want also to highlight that the Cour des Comptes uh, is um, said that the, the evaluation and the performance of the municipal police is a blind spot for the state. So it really highlights the fact that we need to try to find ways to evaluate uh, the municipal police in, in France. Okay, so let's go back to, to Civica. So what have we done since Civica? Uh, with Civica uh, Fund, we managed to digitize more than 2,500 uh, party manifesto for municipal elections from the Sciences Po archives. Okay, so um, I've, like we have done that last June, and uh, they will be uh, available on Sciences Po's platform uh, probably next June, as soon as it's ready, so everyone can um, have a look at, at the municipal manifestos. Uh, and then we also, uh, it took <laughs> a lot of time, but uh, we also gained access to French admin data um, that we're planning to use uh, as well. And we're planning to do two things. Yeah. Um, first, descriptive. We want to explore the links between the expansion of the local police and the municipality's uh, demographics, political orientations, uh, crime rates. 
Um, but as good economists as we are, uh, we also want to uh, study the causal impact of uh, local police forces. And uh, so first thing is to look at the like, normal, uh, usual outcomes that are arrests and, and, and crime, but also move beyond that and have more um, holistic uh, consequences such as the educational outcome, uh, schooling, employment, uh, and focus in particular on, on, um, on young men from immigrant background, which are uh, probably the most affected by the type of policing. And if you have more ideas uh, on what we could do on that, uh, I would be very glad to hear them. Thank you. Great, thank you for, for the enlightening uh, presentation on the topic. It's, it's very interesting what you're trying to do to combine the uh, political sphere with the policing side, especially what was going on uh, recently both in, in academia and maybe what happened uh, in, in reality. So for example, I'm, I'm actually trying to combine that with, with law and economics background. Uh, so maybe also some economic theory um, was mm, applied to law saying, no, well, actually, the, the more you, you police, the more aggressive you are, um, it doesn't impact every type of crime, and it's not the way to go. Uh, but they actually went that way. And then there was a, another wave, maybe more of the behavioral variety, that actually said, okay, so maybe we, we should shall maybe build communities, maybe um, start a dialogue, and they tried that as well. Um, then they decided to defound the police, for example, in the US, and we all know how that went uh, after two years. Uh, and now they're back to um, actual um, intense policing, and the, the far right, for example, is, uh, in Poland is all over the idea of just aggressive policing and keeping everyone uh, in check. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to your framework and to your actual um, empirical analysis um, on this topic. Uh, and now I think it's time to give the floor uh, to Lawrence to present um, the project. Thank you, and the microphone is on. No, sorry. Okay, thank you for this. I'll try the clicker as well. <laughs> I still try to find out now where should we point it towards? Yeah? Okay. So, I'll, uh, like you, Chloe, it's going to be the first time for me to. Oops, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, first time for me to present the, um, um, the project. <laughs> this is very annoying. <laughs> you, know, you know what? Maybe I can. Yeah. And I go left. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so, maybe. And then I have more. Thank you. It's for you as well. <laughs> try to get back. So, first time presenting the, the Merita project. I'm not super prepared because yesterday we had a meeting in the project and we discovered all the things and all the problems and so I, it's like just before the, the, the presentation I was changing some things. So please bear with me, I'm not completely um, uh, <laughs> well prepared. So a lot of people are part of the project. Uh, we have the privilege of having uh, partners in every single civic institution, which has been uh, uh, delightful. And uh, it's not only different institutions, it's also different disciplines that are represented. So the overview of the project is quite simple. The idea is to have a forum, a conversation. And it started about a year ago at the Civica Research Conference in Budapest. And there we prepared a panel and some of us realized, okay, we, we have some things in common. Oh, you're also talking about merits. And oh, I'm talking about merits in, in organization. You're talking about merits in law. Oh, and in politics. And we realized there is something going on here. Let's, let's investigate. So the, <coughs> the, uh, the idea has been this topic of merit, of the notion of merit is there with migration at the, at the border or in the integration of a, a person with a migration background. What, what is meant with merit? Why do we talk about merit? And that has been the, the fundamental question that we started the project with. And the idea is to um, investigate this and in the form of a research project uh, that we will uh, draft we have already drafted a paper that we're still discussing, and uh, the next step is to develop a, a full-scale full research project uh, for international and national calls. So, 
what we realize from the conversation one year ago and from the conversation across discipline and school is that there are different treatments of um, a person who wants to migrate to the EU. Different treatment at the border, different treatment once they're uh, uh, admitted at the in, uh, in, in Europe. So um, basically, depending on your passport, you can just enter or not. Uh, and uh, some, some of us will argue, and in migration studies will argue, well, passport is a proxy for race, basically, or ethnic belonging. So implicitly or not implicitly, but without explicit it, it's, it's there a racial aspect in, at the border. What is going on here? So for entry, those with the right passport, they're welcome, they can stay. Uh, and the, uh, the, and, but the passport, and or the whether this nationality has a right to come in, is clearly linked to the development of the, the, uh, the, the country, but also, we would say, a proxy for race. Once you, those who have the wrong passport, good luck. You know how difficult it is. You know, even if you're skilled, it's very difficult. So once there is, uh, and so once you're in, you manage to get into the EU borders, then there is the idea of integration. So uh, those who have wealth, those who have skills, those who have the, 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 um, the education that uh, the, our countries are, have, have a shortage of, they will, they'll tend to do well, they tend to be integrated, meaning they get, a, they get to work and they get financial stability rather quickly. For those who don't have this wealth, who don't have these skills or, or cultural capital or social capital, they tend to have a harder time. And then the way to integrate or the way to become a citizen, it will be through, for example, um, uh, programs, integration programs. So they are asked to follow some courses. Uh, some could be about uh, sorry, language. Uh, all the course will be about the values of our society and they have to demonstrate, they have to show allegiance that they, uh, they want to be a good citizen and they think along the line of this imagined society because no society really is homogeneous and has a very clear uh, culture. So um, two different treatments, depending on your passport at the entry and depending on your wealth once you're in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the EU. What we realize is that we can link that to the idea of merit. So if they have the merits we want, such as, so you read skills, high skills, or wealth, even can be argued. Uh, they're welcome. It's the easy time to come, and they don't have to show that they're going to be adhering to the values of the Republic in France or the values of, of equality in Sweden. You name it. If they don't have those the stamp of merit, such as skills, highly skilled, to make it short, um, then they have to go through that uh, through those um, uh, integration programs, and there. It's hard to talk about merit. So these persons are not seen as meritorious. They are seen as maybe potentially meritorious. So the first one, they have merit in the sense that they are independent, autonomous. They will not be a burden to society. And the other migrants, those, they, are, they, don't, they cannot demonstrate a merit. At best, they can show that, yes, I know the language. Yes, I will be able to work in the future. And I will not be a burden. And there, and, uh, and, and directly, they become meritorious. So the idea of merit is there, either in positive or in negative, and, and when you're talking about entry and when you're talking in uh, uh, integration. Uh, integration. And um, I'm forgetting something, and I'm looking at my colleagues in the room. Um, I think that's about it for the idea of merit. So what does it mean? It means that we believe the, uh, the way we think, with the way we talk about inclusion in Europe right now, generally speaking, is the inclusion as a meritocratic regime. So depending on your merit, you have the, the, you're worthy of coming in, you're worthy of being included. In itself, it's not necessarily a problem. I mean, you have to, we have to find a way, a narrative or a logic for inclusion of people. So it seems that the dominant one uh, is the one of uh, meritocracy. So in itself, it's not necessarily problematic. However, what we want to say is that let's, let's, um, let's consider what is it we mean with merit. Because if merit is uh, your race because of your passport, 
Is that the kind of merit we want to have to, do, to include people in our society? If merit is just cash, the money that you can buy uh, residency, is that what we value in our society? So the project really wants to question what is merit? Um, there are also the fact that merits are always defined by those, to make it short, by those in power. So you, they tend to reproduce the society and the status quo in terms of power inequality in that society. Uh, we'll see that when we look at the kind of merit asked, most of the time is middle class, uh, white kind of merit and what kind of privilege. So right now, with the meritocratic regime we have for integration, we are reproducing a certain racial and social kind of society. Just to be aware of that, is that what we want? Or are we continuing or creating or reproducing racial and social inequality in our societies? So that's the, these are the questions we are, we are wondering about. And um, I would also say that the, um, you know, if we say, oh, well, merit, you know, if you're skilled, uh, you're going to get a job and you're going to be contributing to society, that's great. But if you're a racialized migrant, you will have a harder time demonstrating your skills than if you're not racialized migrant. And we know that finding a job will be difficult. Going through screening in, in application processes will be different. So saying that merit equivalent to skills or your diploma, it's a fair way. For some it is especially if you're not racial, racialized, and especially if you're coming from middle class. So here we're saying, let's sit, you know, take some time and consider what is it the merit we're, we want to have as criterion, criteria sorry, to, to select people. And uh, I would say, these are not necessarily very inclusive kind of criteria uh, for multiple reasons, and this could be problematic. So, the next step that we have for the, for the project is uh, really to ask, okay, what is, we kind of sure now that integration is a meritocratic logic. Let's explore the limit of this. Not to change it necessarily, but just to be clear, to have like when we say only the meritorious can enter the U, let's define what is merit, really. And uh, we want to do that with a multidisciplinary uh, uh, research. I mean, we have one from sociology, from law, from management. And we, uh, yesterday we went through uh, ideas of what kind of work package we could have. And it looked like a massive project. So that will be the next step. And uh, writing uh, a research application and uh, uh, starting to apply for calls to support research on this idea of uh, integration as a meritocratic regime. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> indeed sounds incredibly vast uh, of a project and philosophical as well, but very much something uh, that is on top of mind everyone in Brussels at the moment, I think, because uh, if anyone agrees on one thing currently in the policy debate, it seems to be that we need to do something with the migration policy. Mm -hmm. They do not know what, but they definitely think they should. Now, just maybe one quick question. Um, I was wondering, do you have defined uh, what the burden is at the moment. Is it social? Is it purely economic burden of someone we would like to allow on, on merit? Or do you, or is it both? Or is it not defined yet? That would burden, what do you mean burden? Because you, you've talked about allowing someone, for example, uh, and checking whether they would be a burden to the society. And I was wondering, what is that burden? Is it only purely yeah. costs? Is it... Um, so right now, I think in the, um, broadly speaking, in, in Europe, that would be most economic. You know, and some people will also say, oh, cultural, you know, they're going to change our values or else. But uh, is that really a burden? I'm not so sure. But this is, imagine, this is in the imaginary of people. This is when you talk about migration and you, you started the, 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 you know, or you, your introduction about this, uh, this discourse and saying there is absolutely no threat. There is no economic threat. There is no, and then it's, that's why we call it imaginary because we are very much in the symbolic sphere, not, I mean, in, in practice, it's, it's a very different story, yeah. Amazing, thank you very much. And I give the floor to, to Claudio now. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I came for Merita, but stayed for uh, EOLOC. <laughs> Um, I was part of the workshop yesterday and I'm really happy I had this opportunity. But today I'm uh, presenting a, a project that has ended. Um, 
it was in a previous round of projects of, uh, you know, Civica funded, this seed funding that you uh, know about. And of course there are connections because the migration now uh, it's increasingly salient and uh, uh, contested um, and kind of feeds in our project. And our project is called Local Mobilization Against the EU, Territorial Dimensions of Populist Euroscepticism, ULOC as an acronym. It should have been anti-EU LOC, but it was probably too long. And the history of this project is it has a uh, kind of a Western leg and Eastern leg. The Western leg is um, uh, at LSE and uh, Mary Caldor, that you may know from her extensive work on conflicts, but also civil society and her team, immediately after Brexit, uh, they try to understand what happened, of course. And uh, one of the things that they've done, they went to, let's say, the most disadvantaged uh, zones in areas in UK and talk to people. Why? I mean, how did they see the whole thing? It was, of course, it was a shock for them, for us, uh, the, the the Brexit vote and a wake up call. That's the Western leg. The Eastern leg is uh, coming from Romania, uh, uh, Romania, which um, has a certain history uh, that it's kind of uh, prone for this approach. Its history is, uh, of, of course, of post-communism, um, in which, away from the very centralized and planned state, we went through a process of economic transformation and also decentralization, and with the, I, I could say, the disappearance of uh, the industry, and the productive capacities from many areas, you suddenly have a very um, a diverse and in the same time increasingly backward uh, a condition for many areas that were somehow developing uh, prior. And I, I'm sure that for Poland and for Hungary, the story is kind of the same. Uh, so basically, uh, out of this need to understand how people in different places, look at the state, look at the government, and look at the EU policy, and look at the EU as a construction, um, we realize that we need a bit more than the usual uh, analysis of your skepticism, which is aggregated at the national level. I mean, most of the, uh, the work is on parties, leaders, discourses, electoral results at national level and EU level, of course. What happens with the local arenas of power and government? And here, we, are we were not that ready to answer what happens. Because, of course, it's a lot of diversity. We have diversity within the member states. But just think of uh, the complicated history of uh, European states at their local, uh, municipal, and regional level. So, in this sense, it's, it's a very broad project. <laughs> because uh, if we look you know, at the sub-national units or sub-national levels of government, you, you get more and more diversity. Uh, so basically what we wanted to do in this uh, very small project, because it's a seed funding, you know, it's just one year, you, you barely have the chance to, pit, to put some people together, which we did, and we were hosted by CEU in Vienna in May last year, uh, was just you know, trying to figure out what are the big, you know, the, the the main avenues to approach this. And uh, of course, we, we, we do have some really good instruments out there. For example, you have a, a political geography perspective in which uh, you look at parties and how they construct their geographical scales, uh, following John Agnew's uh, uh, work, for example, because every party works with scales. I mean, they put emphasis, more or less emphasis, on different levels of government and different places uh, for their political action and political mobilization, and this is a good way to uh, 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 look at it. Um, so a more political geography perspective, which is, it has some beautiful work, even very critical work on how capitalism is working and so on and so forth. 
Um, another another uh, uh, point of contact or point of entry in, in this uh, agenda would be coming from the increasingly rich uh, research on populism, uh, uh, which it's it's growing. It's, it's I would say it's a main uh, trend <laughs> in comparative politics. It's a lot about behavior. It's about a lot about vote, about uh, identities, and so on and so forth. Uh, but increasingly, you have work which looks at organizations and parties and movements. And this is, one, this is one, one thing that we wanted to do, is to go away a bit from this kind of uh, behavior-centered uh, uh, research and go towards st more structural and organizational uh, uh, um, uh, elements. For example, looking at how parties and uh, or movements, they organize at local level to oppose EU policies or something that is considered being EU policy. For example, um, if you're fighting against uh, equality or you tend to discriminate someone, you might think that it's just an EU policy, but it's not like that. We do have our own democratic constitutions uh, everywhere. So it's not just EU, but it can be perceived as an EU-induced pressure or you know, rule. Um, and uh, for example, uh, one of the colleagues from the project, she was not that involved, but she produced a really nice paper for our workshop, Ruth Vodak, she's a big name. Uh, she looked at uh, FPO and how she, FPO built a regional stronghold. And that helped its case to kind of enter national politics as a, uh, a relevant player. In our case, Romania, because uh, following the 2020 uh, Europe, um, uh, parliamentary elections, we had the far right, Eurosceptic, populist, you, you name it, uh, party in the parliament gaining 10% of the vote. And it was uh, quite a shock. It was our Brexit somehow, because we realized that out of nothing, you had an Eurosceptic, far right party in the parliament. And we started thinking, why? Uh, and in our paper, uh, 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 the members of the team from Bucharest look at this party and how their electoral geography uh, kind of shaped. And it was very interesting because we saw that um, it was also a bit of a socioeconomic background there, but the main uh, mobilization, uh, uh, let's say, principle was uh, an identity and spiritual. It was a... Um, conservative constituency in the making that during the pandemic, because the pandemic affected, uh, uh, for example, religious processions uh, with government restrictions, this new party was the only one who opposed the pandemic restrictions and sort of galvanized a very conservative and nationalist constituency. But, and due to the very low turnout uh, of the elections, which were organized during the pandemic, and during restrictions, and during the scare, which of course was territorial, because people were, who were living in the urban areas, large urban areas, it was rational to be afraid of getting infected, because you had you know, a high number of infections, and deaths, and so, and so forth. So they didn't go to vote. Other people went to vote. <laughs> And uh, those people were actually concentrated in some areas in Romania, which were more, let's say, conservative areas. So you basically kind of traced how this kind of nationally conservative vote, which is usually very national and uh, kind of even, uh, actually w was very concentrated in some areas of the country. So um, uh, basically, these are the uh, the the big outlines of of our project, and of course, it's a lot. <laughs> Uh, but we do intend to find some, uh, uh, I don't know, some, some uh, funding opportunities, a good bid, in which we could say that, well, this is important. And uh, if you're interested, uh, 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 please uh, feel free to contact us and, uh, you know, join the conversation. Hopefully it will uh, become some, 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 something more and something bigger. But thank you for the opportunity to present it today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for fantastic presentation. Um, it is something that must go on, I would say, after this year. Listening to, to your story was like I had a flashback um, 
what happened to Poland in the last four years, basically. The same cases, the same premises, uh, the same tricks, like um, trying to speed up an election to be within the pandemic, for example, um, to, to institute fear. Uh, we will have the same thing as well at the moment. We fully expect to have a far-right party with 10% of parliamentary share who can only be described as a far-right populists, they represent nothing, but they will say anything that uh, needs to be said to win, but the, the main platform is basically freedom, let's oppose anything, cut taxes and so on, people love it, right? Um, so that works and it is, um, I think, just happens in other places as well and it works so well. So I think maybe some cognitive neuroscientists or maybe uh, psychologists should be involved as well, um, social psychologists to, to understand the, the phenomena. Thank you so much for, for the fantastic presentation. And now we have a 25 minutes and I would like to open um, the floor to questions. Um, absolutely, fantastic, we already have three. Um, should I go or? I'll go. Yes, yes, I think just take, take three questions, questions and then answer oh, yeah. you. Thank you all. It uh, was extremely insightful and diverse, and uh, I think uh, also very kind of conducive to hopefully future evidence-based policy making. Uh, as a third country national uh, from Kazakhstan, I was particularly interested in uh, this whole discussion, and I, I had two questions uh, specifically for Chloe and uh, for uh, Laurence. Uh, um, if I may, so uh, regarding policing, I was curious to see how did you operationalize and determine uh, this aggressive, um, uh, harmful policing, so, so, sort of what did you look at, um, what kind of indicators or whether it's in the process of development. And um, uh, for uh, Laurence, I wanted to ask whether you see sort of any um, capitalist uh, slash uh, labor policy dimension to this whole um, meritocratic discourse as opposed to race. So basically looking at whether you can exploit cheap labor force from specific countries um, uh, and um, ma basically make the labor price for them go even further down. So let's, uh, if we look at uh, some Gulf monarchies, which do not necessarily belong to the same place, uh, even though I don't like uh, this concept, um, they have UAE and Saudi Arabia, etc. they have very easy uh, visa access as opposed to, let's say, Central Asian countries, um, which can be, uh, I think, exploited for much cheaper labor force. And how does this meritocratic aspect reflect there. I'm just uh, was very curious also from a personal perspective because uh, I was, for example, hired as a German speaker consultant uh, at a certain Lithuanian company, but of course I'm personally much cheaper than an Austrian <laughs> or a German. Um, so whether there is also this labor market dimension to this whole story. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the interventions. I had a question also for the Merita project. I wanted to ask if you're also taking into account uh, ethnic minorities or if you're focusing only on migrants or maybe even the intersections between ethnic minorities and migrants. I'm thinking of the example of uh, Roma that fled from uh, Ukraine and were treated very differently uh, at the border. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, Jelena Jankic from, uh, from DUI. Thank you so much for three fascinating presentations. And I was super happy to learn uh, all the wonderful research that has come out of uh, the Civica uh, projects. My question again, I think Laurence, you'll uh, be the superstar of this round of questions, uh, is, is for you. And here I'm gonna use a bit of my double hat as someone who looks uh, at things conceptually and ask you, uh, what is the next step? Is it to look into the conception of merit, which if you start to think about it, historically has been ingrained in community constitution as much as, let's say, blood-related transmission of membership. So what is, what is different about how merit is used now? Because if you think of ancient Greece and who was allowed to uh, become a member to migrate from one polis to another, it's not too different to what's going on uh, right now. So what is the, what's the thing that's gonna spark our interest in the topic and keep it? And I think you're onto something potentially very big here. And on my other hat as an empiricist, um, how would you operationalize merit? And especially in the context of the EU, and which parameters would you use in this case and why? I had a third question, but it was covered by, <laughs> by, by the first. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And perhaps Claudio, I was wondering whether you could give us some insight into what, what the next steps would be for, for you, for your project, for the collaboration. Thank you. Okay, um, so as I said, it's very much uh, work in progress, okay? So um, we have uh, two ideas to look at uh, like how do we identify um, aggressive policing. One thing is um, for big municipal police department, they have to sign agreements with the national police and some of these ag agreements are uh, public, uh, I found a few of them, so where we see like, oh, the national police will do this task, this task, and the municipal uh, will help with that and that, so that would be helpful to identify um, wh 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 which officer do what. Uh, but I'm not sure um, of how many are publicly available. So the other thing that we thought originally was to uh, look at the political manifestos. And that's indeed why we digitize so many municipal uh, election manifestos. Um, so the idea was to, to look at the, what uh, parties um, propose and try to identify if it was like to, like to target uh, immigrants especially or not. Um, so far I find that a lot of parties advertise for municipal uh, police force. It's absolutely not restricted to, um, to, to radical right or, or conservative parties. Um, but yeah, uh, then, then it's hard to identify exactly which tasks uh, they, they will assign though. But we, we have the general idea of the party. So We'll try to look into that. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> um, starting with merit and blood. Yes, absolutely. Um, let, let me start this way. When we say, oh, this is a meritocratic way of uh, recruiting. I mean, I'm in management. When I, I'm in a recruitment process right now, and the HR partner tells me, we're gonna have an interview guide based on merit. Okay, show me the guide. You know, she defines merit. How do you define merit? And this is, this is where it becomes very interesting. Uh, so that's the operational part. I think we will have different work package. Uh, for example, one in organizations. How do organizations define merit? How do they, what is it that they see as a merit in employees? And hard work could be a merit. And this is an answer to your question, because you can have people from third country, you, you, you know what I mean, uh, we'll have people from uh, Vietnam or from Thailand and Sweden coming during the summer, close to exploitation, if it's not pure, pure exploitation. Oh, they're married, they're hardworking, and they go home after the summer. 
No, so what is merit? What is it really that we define as merit? And is it something that we're proud of? Is it something that is aligned with our view on society and the European ideal of inclusion, fairness, human rights? And this is what we want to show. We want to show that when, when we talk about merit, most people will say, this is a good thing, this is fair, this is, you know, there is a chance for everyone. But actually, it is not, because merit right now, the way it's defined, hides too much of ascribed status of class and blood. So we completely agree, and this is what we want to show. We want to show that this is a smoke screen to talk about merit and make you believe that it's just your talent that's going to make a difference, because it's not. And this is then my connection to you. Uh, yes, person with a migration background, obviously, especially at the border, but the persons who have uh, in the family, a migration background in the family, so ethnic minority in Europe, within Europe, in within any country, they also suffer from this, uh, this uh, stigmatization or racialization. So for example, in recruitment process and organizations, whether a person, I, I used to say, not, I don't differentiate between migrants and ethnic minorities, I said, um, person with a migration background, because in an organization, it looks pretty much the same, the same kind of treatment. Yeah. So what is expected of them is different. So it, but this, we recognize the same logic as the border. So, uh, sorry, of uh, wealthy and less wealthy. So the uh, ethnic minority are asked to show allegiance. Yeah, how well are you included in, your, in, in this society? What do your parents do, by the way? You know, this kind of question that you hear in an interview that you would never hear about someone who's not racialized. So the, the difference of the expectation and the merit or idea of what, is des what makes them deserve the position, which is different than merit, is also something to, uh, to, work, to work with. And I think I answered all the questions. Did I manage to answer all the questions? Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, what's what, what's next? Um, what in terms of uh, let's say um, the logistics of the research? Probably we have to find some uh, bed in which our project should uh, fit. Um, I would say it's it's still very broad because if you think, I mean, we can identify not only parts. We can identify. Uh, community groups, uh, uh, social movements, even religious groups, for example, who are actual are active at local level in different uh, uh, ways, and it would be a huge effort to map them, you know, in every EU country. And I have to say, this is not relevant just for the EU countries. It's relevant for the accession countries, for example, Western Balkans. We, uh, we it's, there are things that are ha happening there, and they're very interesting. Um, uh, of course, we have to pursue that in uh, UK because there is a whole dynamic there. It's a whole dynamic with, uh, you know, rejoin. <laughs> it's an, a new uh, uh, movement which is actually not uh, new. It's old. Uh, and this is one of the things that we could do. For example, look at history because if you look at these patterns. These are not, uh, and I know that we suffer from presentism. We look at, just because we have a party which got 10% in the last elections, we tend to think that it's very recent. But I think that vote was built in time. And it's not just decades, I would say centuries. If you look at the Romanian case, you'd see that the vote for uh, this party, uh, it's concentrated in some historical regions who have their own characteristics. And it's not just from, from today. I mean, they came later into the state building project. They were more conservative on the average, and they had a bit of uh, Russian influence, uh, which in Central East Europe, you do have to take it into account. So uh, uh, and in the UK, I mean, I don't want to go too far, but if you look at the Industrial Revolution <laughs> and how it went, and how uh, the, the Thatcherite rollback of 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 uh, the state kind of explains a lot uh, of the geography of the Brexit vote. So I, I would I think we have to go into the history. Um, there are some some more recent history. For example, the fact that our own uh, citizens went abroad to work, and we have almost four million people working abroad in Europe. So this is recent. But there are other things that go back uh, into history and. We have to take that uh, into account. And again, 
Um, there's a, it's a very broad project to look at parties, movements, uh, organizations uh, working at the local, municipal, county, and regional level opposing a, a part or a policy or a direction or the EU in itself. So this is huge and of course we'd need help from you if you're interested. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't want to occupy too much time, but given the opportunity, I also <laughs> wanted to ask Claudio if you could elaborate a little bit more on the evolution of this um, uh, party. Um, I mean, looking at the current polls, they have doubled their results, right? They're polling around at 20%, and like, what do you think in the post-COVID era with all the restrictions which are falling? Um, what drives this and whether you see again the same recurring uh, regional pattern or is the regional pattern different already? Um, thank you. Um, I would say that the most interesting thing about this party is that their highest vote was, I mean, as a proportion of the votes that they were gathered by uh, uh, the other parties and uh, the actual turnout, the biggest share of vote was in the diaspora, which is very interesting because for a party which is conservative, nationalistic, and it's kind of tied to the territory, and there's, it produces this mix of territory blood identity to have the highest, uh, uh, you know, the uh, highest uh, uh, vote in the diaspora it kind of tells you a story in how this kind of, uh, 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 an a nationalistic and, and uh, uh, conservative constituency is deterritorialized in a way. Uh, that's the one thing that it's uh, in interesting. Second, uh, it's changing and the pandemic pattern or the pandemic effect, I think it's, it's kind of uh, losing uh, uh, importance, but you tend to find other issues in which you I mean, they position themselves. For example, their anti-Ukraine help, <laughs> as you might <laughs> expect. Uh, and they gather a lot of uh, kind of um, socioeconomic discontent. They capture that uh, rather well. And there is a bit of a political dynamic because currently we have a, a large coalition, a grand coalition between the main center right and the main center left party, kind of on, on, a, on a German uh, model, so they kind of captured the discontent with uh, this kind of. Uh, so I, I I don't know what what happens. Or what I, I would be really interested to see because next year we have European elections, like everyone, but also we have parliamentary elections and local elections, and I'm really curious to see how they perform, and where they perform well, and if the this kind of uh, the pattern of voting, which is sort of uh, you know was created by the pandemic and the conservative mobilization sort of get, is getting institutionalized. So I cannot tell. I'm really curious. And I have to tell you that it's, uh, it's also a big question for our you know, democratic system, how they, how they perform. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not yet written, <laughs> this uh, history, but we're going to follow it. Thank you. Yes, uh, so my question is really an open question to all the panelists uh, and is less academic, you'll be here, uh, pleased to hear. So I just wonder in terms of the mechanism of research collaboration, the multi-institution collaboration under the Civica network, what do you find are the uh, key challenges and what do you think the Civica research differentiate from the the other organic form of the research collaboration you would otherwise form. So I'm just quite keen to understand a bit more about that. Thank you. So um, I'm not an expert in your fields, but my question is, um, as a political scientist, I always think that uh, the uh, power and authority separated. So I, I, I remember Lawrence mentioned the merits are this 
or one of you mentioned that merit is decided or defined by those who are in power. So in all, the, all, all of these complexities that you mentioned, actually, how do you, how do you define actually uh, the power from within the community organizations and the social agency? And how do they play their role? I mean, I'm, I'm, I know maybe I'm adding more complexity to the problem, but how does it play uh, their role in defining merit? Uh, in LSE, where I'm from, there is also uh, a group of academics looking at merit uh, used to define elites, elites using merit uh, to form a commu community of themselves, maybe without realizing, and then there is a comparison between Denmark and UK. A paper has just been published. I'll forward it to you, Lawrence, so you can uh, share with the others. Um, so that's, that's also interesting to see that mer merit is, is defined from the other side of the fence. And uh, another thing that I was thinking when you were talking um, is, is uh, how, how, where, where does religion <laughs> appear on the scene? Or are we just thinking in all of these uh, three case studies that we want to keep away from it? Or is social cultural values are kind of including the religion as a, as a tribe? Like if you look at EU integration, it's also a bit of a religious union from uh, my perspective. I might be naive in thinking that way. But, uh, but that also defines which uh, migrants are accepted or, or welcomed or not. Or, or how they are perceived, the way they are uh, maybe using religion to, to identify their own religious identities, and sometimes even by law, uh, that is also defined. So, uh, yeah, these are just thoughts, no, no questions, uh, but I uh, just want to share with you. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the, the this uh, absolutely, and that's th an idea of the project is to. I mean, we we feel that merit is defined differently depending on who are the actors. So there are different actors in society, and would be um, at the EU level, at the national level, at, at soci civil society organization for the inclusion of migrant define their merit differently than our organization would. So we are aware of that. They are, and then the migrant themselves, do they buy into this meritocratic uh, narrative? Uh, and if yes, how? Just like um, the person from a um, uh, labor class background define merit differently than a person with a, um, a middle class uh, background. So there is, there is a lot of, uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun here, I, I know. <laughs> um, Religion? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is so much about religion. I mean, uh, we're saying it's about race, clearly, but religion, in terms of if you look at the program for inclusion integration program, uh, we, we've been told yesterday about some examples, of especially uh, it's targeted against Islam in some societies. Clearly, it's, it's uh, I don't want to say it's the elephant in the room. I think everybody knows this is against religion, and especially Islam in some countries. And that's also something uh, shall we be more open about it? Uh, and that's, again, people reacting to, uh, this, is, uh, this is who we are, we are a Christian Europe, this is a, how do we define ourselves? We're going back to what kind of society do we want to be? And do we really want to continue this distinction between Christian, religious, non-religious, like, like we, we have right now? Is that a way forward for an inclusive Europe? Uh, that's, these are questions we have, yeah. Okay, so now, Back to the, uh, the, the, the question on why is, uh, what are the challenges and to what extent is it different than other collaborations? Thank you for the question, <laughs> it's a difficult one. <laughs> um, from I have a collaboration in multiple, uh, in multiple uh, organizations. Um, I would say the challenges are pretty much the same. Uh, one key difference is that we stick together. So I have, p I have uh, colleagues or partners in other university, like just University of Sydney or University of Mount La Vallée, you know, just, just name it. And then we'll have a project, it will work, and then at some, at some times 
we don't have uh, funding anymore or and we, we tend to go separate directions. But my impression with Civica, which is relatively new, right, is that we constantly get to see each other. We see each other in conferences, then I hear about a new study. And then so we constantly, we have where the, the it's a web which is much more, it's much tighter than any other collaboration I've had before. And I think that's a distinctive feature. And we also have um, the, the, the support from our institutions. Uh, and, and helping us, and you see, for example, I, I have to think of you, <laughs> uh, is um, I receive an email from LSE um, telling us, are you aware that there is this uh, uh, opening in Sweden about this project? I said, yes, I'm aware. Oh, do you, do you want, are you targeting it? Yes, we're targeting it next year. Just having someone else, one more person reminding you or helping you, it's amazing. I mean, the support is fantastic. So that's, that's to me, that's a big difference. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, as a PhD student, I don't have so many other collaborations, but I can say that um, for me, it was a great opportunity to actually approach someone uh, at Sciences Po. Like, uh, I sent an email as, like describing uh, the idea, and then, uh, I, yeah, I, I think that was great because I had the support of Civica saying, like, look, we can apply for funding if we manage to find this idea together. Um, yeah, and, and on other things, I managed also to, to go to the LSE as a visiting student, so like that's also like, very, like great. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's wonderful to have this network. Um, I'll just answer on the religion uh, element and then on, on oh, it's too important to miss it. Well, I have to say that um, if you look at the um, kind of real political events uh, currently, even before the war in Ukraine, you, you could see an insurgent conservatism, which has two pillars. One pillar is the uh, neo-Protestant uh, global movement with origins in the United States. And some very interesting uh, uh, branches, for example, the Brazilian branch. I mean, we have Brazilian pastors coming to Bucharest to present the word of God, which is an interesting uh, thing to see. Um, so that's one pillar. And you could actually feel it, um, maybe less in Western Europe, but you can definitely feel it in Eastern Europe. And... Uh, if you if you want to s um, to see a kind of the magnitude of this influence, just think of the actually successful attempts to have referendums for changing the constitution. For example, to ban the same-sex marriages. We had one in Romania. We have Slovakia, also Croatia. So this is not just any kind of uh, mobilization. It it is political, and it has real effects, if not uh, unchecked. And the second pillar is, of course, the, uh, the orthodox, uh, pan-orthodox Russian-backed influence that you could see, for example, in the organization of the World Congress of Families, which go to all kinds of interesting places, for example, Italy or Hungary, and you have uh, people which are associated associated with the Russian regime and its conservative um, kind of uh, structures, um, and they meet. They meet. I mean, of course, you know that Orthodox they don't like Catholics. Generally, they don't like uh, neo Protestants. But when it, when they have to uh, oppose liberalism, very narrow, of, you know broadly defined, they have no problem, no problem of joining forces. Uh, so I would say that religion is there, it's insurgent, it has real political effects, and yes, we have to take it into account. Uh, and to answer uh, in a more optimistic uh, uh, way about the how Civica works, I'm, I'm really happy that it's there, because especially coming from Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, you have to imagine that during communism, um, social sciences 
were marginalized. And to the extent they were not marginalized, they were perverted by the needs of the regime. Yeah, to <laughs> plan the economy, uh, you know, support the party, uh, Communist Party, and so on and so forth. That in, in early 90s, we have to build from scratch. I mean, not us, I mean, not me, because I was so young. But, uh, you know, professors, researchers who have, you know, they were trained in, you know, philosophy, history, and they had to go into political science to, you know, create a, a discipline out of nothing, almost. So, uh, for me, as an Eastern European, uh, coming from Eastern European institution, I think it's very good to have the structure and to have a sense of continuity and, uh, you know, permanent uh, continuity and work together because that helps us to overcome historical uh, um, obstacles and shortcomings and um, to become or be in the position to contribute to the conversation, to research, because, you know, uh, it's, uh, there are so many things that need to be researched in Eastern Europe, and there is certain uh, s a, a sense of convergence, historical convergence between East and West, that we are responsible to uh, account for. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this insightful um, talk. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think this was a very uh, optimistic way to try to close our panel. We talked about sticking together, we talking about continuity, about networking, uh, and I think that's the values and messages that we would like to finish this panel with. Uh, I am very grateful to the audience, to our fine, fantastic panelists. I think the split of um, of Western Europe representing, trying to um, optimize and fight for European values uh, in one way, and then two representatives from the Eastern flank trying to also fight for European values, but maybe in more survivalistic manner at this moment, uh, also gives uh, a lot of hope and a lot of um, foresight. So thank you so much, and I would like to close our fantastic panel. Great, thank you. <laughs>